Hello, I now present to you this 1914 Blickensturfer aluminum featherweight typewriter. So, what makes this machine significant is that it uses what is called a single type element like these instead of multiple type bars, say on this, those three machines and this torpedo where you have to press keys in order to individual keys to produce text. Whereas on this machine, you instead have a single type element which has all the letters, in this case cast or molded, onto them. Whereby as you type, that cylinder will rotate in order to present the desired or corresponding letter with a key to make an impression on the paper like this. Now, so the Blickensdurfer typewriter company dates back to 1893, given that the t typewriters um, have been around at least, well, the Scholz and Glidden dates back to the 1860s and 70s, whereby after their patent expired, uh, companies began producing typewriters with dual keyboards instead of a shift key. So, yeah, this Remington here from 1902 is based on the design and layout that was pioneered by the Scholz and Glidden, where you basically have your keys, QWERTY, of course, which still used today, modern computers, computer keyboards, as well as this 1980 electric typewriter. And here you can see that the type bars, they move upwards and strike the paper where you couldn't see anything. So companies such as a Calligraph typewriter company produced some of the first competing commercial typewriters. Um, similar to this, but of a different layout. This is a Yoast typewriter. And eventually, companies like Crandall and Hammond came about also, producing probably what would have been the first of the single element typewriters, where instead of using those type bars, they would use these. So this is a 1925 Hammond, folding Hammond, one of the last of its kind, well, before the Veritiper company came into being. Then the Crandall would have been more similar to this machine, the Mignon, which I covered in the preceding video. Except that you instead of have a special two row keyboard where each key press will automatically move and rotate this cylinder, which will then strike the paper. So, as I mentioned in the video covering that Minion typewriter, these machines with single elements had one major advantage over these type bar typewriters, which is that it's a lot easier and more economical to change the typeface. So instead of having to remove the entire segment or swap out the entire segment, um, which you can see over here. So this is your segment, and you have this whole selection of um, type bars and the segment to which they are mounted. And if you wanted to change the typeface or your font, on this machine, you would either have to switch to a different machine or completely replace this. Though there were some typewriters, such as the Imperial um, downstriking typewriters, which made this a bit easier and more interchangeable. But those, but the cost of actually um, producing that new typeface was still a lot more expensive than just molding or casting one of these type wheels. So in this case, with the Blickensturfer. I recently, from the Galerie Alt Technique um, auction house on ebay.de, Germany, acquired two new type cylinders compared to the original. So this is the original basic one that came with this aluminum Blickensturfer and has a layout of characters which matches the sublegends on this particular keyboard. So if you want to change the typeface, 
you would just go over here. So right now I have an italic type cylinder, which I acquired. You could just rotate this little retaining spring and then pull it out. And then if you want, you can switch, say, to this nice looking script typeface, like you can see here. So that was the italic one that I removed. And then stick that in quickly. Now, fortunately, the ink is already dried. So that just goes in. And then the retaining clip will click into place, like so. And then you'll be ready to type. So, again, as I already mentioned in the Minion typewriter video, you can have these other uh, type cylinders that you can interchange. And in this case, I recently finally received this wonderful Fractor, quite hard to find Fractor type cylinder. I had to, now I don't have the original index, so I had to draw, scan, and print out my own and just put it on top of the script, already hard to find script index. And it works nicely, as you can see. Produces a nice type. And now we also have this Bennett typewriter, which has a similar kind of type cylinder to the Blick, and then the Hammond, which instead has these rotating shuttles. Now in terms of operation of this typewriter, where you have your type cylinder, once actually installed, rotating and hitting the platen, and being easily removed by twisting this clip here. So pretty much if you look up close, you'll notice that there's a little notch that allows the spring to go through and interface with that groove in the type shaft. We have a similar principle with the IBM Selectric that came decades later. It's arguably very much based on the Blickensturfer, where you have a bunch of different type balls, like so, which you can easily remove, like so, and then put back and replace, etc., if you want to quickly change your typeface. Now, a difference between these two type cylinders I got from Gallery Altechnik is that the bottoms are flat, whereas it is depressed or concave in the original one. Now, the reason that was concave is because there is a nut under here that goes under, and unfortunately, these ones which I had received didn't fit. So I had to carefully and painstakingly file this down. Uh, now that does not affect the operation of this mechanism, though I might encounter some issues if I ever want to remove that nut, but otherwise, I mean, I definitely didn't want to wait to get an older Blickensturfer just to be able to use these nice typefaces. Um, so that all works. Now another thing is, um, I was originally able to at least read from the type samples on the eBay lots that these were indeed of the Dia Tensor layout. So this layout is um, what the inventor of this typewriter called the scientific layout, insofar as it was scientifically or empirically designed to be more efficient than QWERTY layout of the original typewriters, or basically what we still use today. And in this case, you would have your home row on the bottom instead of on the middle. And the ordering of these letters, I believe, is with respect to the frequency of these in the English corpus or language of text. So, now one thing is so let's just put an example, type cylinder.
that's a script one. So, whenever you press these keys, it rotates the type cylinder. And in this case, it so happens that the closer a character is to the middle, the less it will rotate. And I guess within the sequence from here and here, all the way to here, so this being the least frequent character on this side, and Z being the least frequent on this side, this is where the cylinder will move the most, and it will also be the hardest for you to access. So that means that when you're typing, the both the characters that are easiest to access, and that will be most quickly indexed, as in the cylinder has to move the least, will be available like so when you're typing, while the least frequent and also the longest taking to index will be harder to access. So that basically optimizes this layout for typing as well as um, for the mechanical operation of this machine. So that's how the dia tensor layout, as I call it, so I mean tensor is a word used in mathematics, um, works where it optimizes based on letter frequency and the amount of motion that would resultingly be required for the type cylinder to index to the correct character. Now, of course the idea then is that when you're buying these new type cylinders or typefaces for your Blickensturfer or for any of these machines, even the Hammond, you definitely don't want to accidentally buy a cylinder that's only um, compatible with a different typeface like QWERTY as if you try to put it into these machines, it might produce characters, but they definitely won't match your keyboard. And, of course, you can't fit QWERTY, UIOP, onto the top row, since that's 10 characters instead of 8. And, in this case, one thing that I kind of failed to realize was that these two cylinders that I got are of a British layout with a bunch of fractions. So that means that it isn't perfectly compatible with the layout of this machine, as you can see, which mainly has punctuation. But otherwise, all of your main letters and some symbols are still in the same place, but then you would have to consult a different or external legend in order to be able to remember, like for example, that I have to, instead of getting a dash from here, I have to go here while holding down the fix key. And then if I want a apostrophe, I'll have to go to the Q. And for a quotation mark, I'll have to go to the Z. So when I first received this machine, it was all super gummed up, even though the seller said that it was functional and that the carriage advanced, but I wouldn't be surprised if either they or someone else had used uh, WD-40. <laughs> And by the time the machine arrived, it had completely been seized. So fortunately, I was eventually able to get myself a bottle of liquid wrench, use that, and this machine hasn't binded since, and it's just been operating nice and smoothly. Though sometimes I did have to um, clean the carriage rail, what allows this machine to, with the carriage that holds the paper, to move smoothly back and forth. Um, but otherwise, I was still stuck with the original hardened and compacted ink roller. Meaning that, though I could technically type, I wouldn't be able to see what I'm typing. So, fortunately, in the same auction week in which I got these, I was also able to purchase an original vial of Blickensturfer ink rollers. So these would contain your pre-inked ink rollers. I'm not going to take that one out, but now I'm currently using one here that had probably never been used before, though I did have to apply some solvent in this case just liquid wrench, my catch-all, to help dissolve um, or some of the original 
I guess I call it, I believe it's called the carrier or the vehicle um, that basically allows your pigment to flow from the reservoir, in this case a felt, onto the paper or onto the typeface. So the idea is that you would lift up this armature and then pull up this little uh, now rather dirty uh, retaining piece and move the old ink roller and then place in a new one else you could keep on using the existing one provided that the felt was still in good shape and then you would just use this ink vial here I'm not sure if they had a special tool for, applic for application this one actually happens to already be empty though stained And you could just replenish the ink on this little roller instead of having to change the typeface. So this does have some advantages in terms of convenience of use, whereby pretty much as you type, it will roll against the surface of the type wheel. So say if you press the caps lock, so Again, you can see there are three rows of characters, and each row is for each quote-unquote layer on your typewriter. And that will present the respective row of characters to the platen when you're typing, and likewise in this case, this roller will apply ink to that part, or to that particular character, before it's striking the paper, but as you can see, it will also ink the characters in the upper rows if you're on the fig setting. So that's kind of inefficient and, of course, messy, as you can see from my fingers. Ideally, I would have um, removed and handled these type cylinders with paper towel or something else, gloves. But, yeah, it's still relatively convenient. Now, compared to older Blickensturfers, so this is basically what came after the number 6 aluminum featherweight circa uh, 1910 while this machine was produced in 1914 the original Blickensturfer number 5 from 1894 would have had a horseshoe shape here to which would be mounted this armature with the ink roller but starting with these aluminum models they started using this I call it the squaw neck, that can be folded down more easily. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the exact benefits of having this shape instead of a instead of that horse In fact, I'd argue that with this thing there, it kind of gets in the way of your removing a typeface. Like so. But I mean, at least the main advantage for me <laughs> is that you can actually carry it, like so. It's nice and sturdy. So in terms of features, I had already covered the caps and fix keys and how that basically moves your type cylinder up in order to access more characters. So pretty much your caps is, of course, your the analog of your shift key which allows you to access the capital letters, but since this machine only has three banks as it's called, instead of four, like on your modern keyboards, or basically, technically, even the original typewriters, or Scholl's typewriters in Revington, upstrikes, uh, you would need a separate fixed key to access more symbols which are indicated by the sublegends on your keyboard. So, given that, then, your equivalent of caps lock would be this little slider here, 
You just slide that and you have a little notch that will hold the key down and then hold the type cylinder up while you're typing. Same goes for a fixed key. Different typewriters have different implementations of this. So I can spin it. You have this little folding thing with notches and grooves. Or like this. Or in this case, on these type R typewriters, you just press down on this little key. Then you press this to release it. Then we have features pertaining to the actual feeding of the paper so that you can actually type something. Now this machine, this feed roller, which is important for actually allowing the paper to be pulled in to the machine so that you can advance a page and basically produce lines. This feed roller was originally all cracked and expanded as well as flattened on some parts. That typically happens with age depending on the type of rubber they used, as well as whether or not the owner was responsible and basically made sure to keep this paper release, which moves that feed roller away from the platen in its released position, or as otherwise it will stay stuck and eventually flatten over the decades that it has been stored. So pretty much what I did was I just, in this case, sometimes I might try to use some hot glue to fill in the flat space and then carefully sand it into shape. Um, in this case I instead had to actually sand it away the surface and that basically removed most of the cracks and also produced a nice and smooth surface. It isn't perfect, but it works. Now, so for actually feeding paper, you would first make sure that your paper release is disengaged. Then you would stick the paper in, slide it up until it rests against the feed roller, like so. And in this case, you might also want to align it with the paper scale here. Then you can just use a platen knob, in this case it just has one on the right side, to pull the paper. And I've found that to get a decent um, setting of your top margin, you would just align the paper with the edge of this little guide. And sometimes I might also want to check that the paper is not fed crookedly. So to do that, you would engage your paper release, which allows you to slide the paper until it is aligned. Then, in this case, we have our carriage release. So, that carriage release is basically just a bar which pushes on this little, this large pin here. And allows your carriage to move freely left and right. But that interface does contribute a fair bit of friction. So, same thing as on the Mignon. I prefer to just hold down the spacebar, which on these particular machines with the design of their escapement, the escapement being what is responsible for moving the carriage along as you type, allows you to release the carriage when you're holding the spacebar down. So that's my preferred method. Then, if you want to set your left margin, basically where the text starts on the left side of the page, you would go to this spot here, where you have a scale and a, this little thing which you basically just push in and slide where you wish. In this case I have it set just to one inch. That scale would basically tell you
um, how much or how large your left margin is. And in this case, this would basically be your left margin releases, which is also what you use to remove the carriage, which I'll show later. And now inserting this footage before it's too late. So this machine, while it has a left margin, does not have at least a settable right margin. It only has the fixed um, tab over here for stopping the carriage from moving this way, hence why you can only remove the carriage at least easily from this side. But what you can set is you can move this little bar here, which is basically what controls at what point in time you'll hear the bell. So that pretty much moves that little arm there. Which then causes that striker to hit the bell. So now that your margin, your top and left margin are set, you're ready to type. Now, I guess before that, I'll note that an interesting thing is that there's a special mechanism here. This little piece which moves. So as you type, there is a little rod there which rotates and pushes on this little piece here and rotates what I guess I can call the cursor out of the way, so that little notch will tell you where the character that you're going to type is. So, like, let's say... You can see that the next character will be positioned right there. And you can see that we're producing text in a nice script typeface. So given that, you basically just type. I mean, though... Of course, the main thing that would differ between using any other typewriter would be your technique. So compared to other type R typewriters, the keys, as you can see, move down almost three centimeters, which is the deepest I know of any typewriter, whereas most machines go between 1.5 to 2 centimeters when you press a key, which is, of course, already quite high compared to the 3.6 to 4 millimeters of most mechanical keyboards or rubber dome keyboards. Now, this Hammond lease, which I'll cover in a future video, does have about uh, one centimeter travel, but that's because the action of the machine is aided by the mainspring, which stores the energy um, for both making the impressions and moving the carriage along. So, again, I already have a fair bit of practice with this weird layout. So let's say I want to say, hello world. I am currently typing on a witness for typewriter. Now, um, one characteristic of these machines that they're called visible visible typewriters because you can see what you're typing as you're doing it, whereas these upstrike machines, since the type bars um, move upwards, and the only reason they move upwards like that is because that's pretty much all they thought of, or the main solution to the typing problem that they had at the time, before decades later, in the 1890s, they finally came up with this front striking design. Um, then in terms of visibility, you can see what you're typing, but it's just that you do still have to, like, move your head over and peer to see your text. So yeah, I'm currently typing on a Blickenstorfer typewriter. So you would have seen that in order to actually um, implement your typewriter equivalent of a return, or an enter key, you have to put your thumb here and press on this little lever. So this is technically 
almost like a, I guess it's kind of more so a flexible approach give, depending on your, yeah, your desired amount of um, line spacing. So basically you have little, kind of hard to read, in this case not exactly accurate scale. And as you turn this little screw, it will control by how much the paper advances. So that's basically your line spacing, which you can set in Microsoft Word by right-clicking and <laughs> clicking paragraph, and then that will give you the spacing options. So in this case, you literally had to um, adjust a screw, or sometimes, well, more commonly, just move a little lever here, as you can see. That would set your line spacing. Like so. So, I guess, yeah, the way that works then is it pretty much controls at what point this little lever, so the motion of this lever is of a fixed displacement or angle, and setting this screw will define for how much of that angle it will move this. So in this case, if you set the screw later, then the less the flatten will turn for each carriage return or line advance. And I guess once you've set your line spacing, you can just turn this little thumb screw to seal it and tighten it in place. I will now cover the details of how this machine actually goes from a key press to this type cylinder rotating to imprint the correct character onto the page, as well as how the escapement works on this machine to move the carriage along by discrete spaces and uniform spaces to allow your characters to be spaced evenly like so. So to remove the carriage, we simply lift this left margin stop and slide the carriage past your left margin. And then that will just come off nicely, like so. So you can see the carriage rack and I think yeah one of these is probably yeah this one this side would be responsible for the actual advancing while the other side is responsible for the backspace operation anyways moving that out of the way you'll see that when you press a key This thing here moves and basically pushes that set of teeth back and out of the way of the corresponding rack on the carriage. Then, and I guess, yeah, because of the way it is slanted, it will be able to slide in this direction without actually moving or influencing the carriage. So that will move out of the way and then. As you release, it will move back into place and then push the carriage along by one space. So that's all repeated and I believe in similar fashion to the Mignon. So yeah, these escapements are quite similar between these two machines. You would have this thing coming back into place to help lock the carriage into position so that it doesn't move back and forth when you're not typing. Um, then we have these rollers, which help reduce the friction of the carriage while it's in position. And then we have the backspace mechanism, which, first of all, yeah, in turn moves that pawl out of the way, and also 
apply a special mechanism as this is pushed in. As you can see, or rather, while well, this part is moving in, and the back of that rack is stationary, this pin, uh, this curved surface, will cause this pin to move in this direction, implementing your backspace, moving your carriage in the opposite direction of the regular motion. Then under the machine, you'll basically see the corresponding parts. So rollers, bell mechanism, in this case this is your touch control pretty much. So that controls the spring force here that resets your escapement mechanism and pushes the carriage along. So in this case this is the minimum force to make it feel light, which is my preference when typing on these machines. I like a light touch. And if you were to say try to make that spring even lighter, there is a certain point where it will no longer be strong enough to push the carriage along. So you have to be careful with that if you want to, say, do a modification to improve the typing experience. So now the question is of how the motion from the keys is transferred to this escapement as well as the backspace. So first of all, the backspace here pretty much is connected to a special linkage. Like so. So you can see that pulling on that lever also pulls down this lever which rests on this pivot so that it will rotate this direction instead. And then that goes to the bottom of the machine to interface with well there's a chance that it depends rather much on, oh right because it's being <laughs> pushed on already. That will push on that little Um, arm over there to move this backspace mechanism forward. So basically that is a special linkage that transfers a downward motion to a forward motion. Then for the actual keys, as you press a key, that interfaces with the bar within the machine which moves one of these two bars, which then moves a sector gear, which rotates another sector gear, as you can see, which interfaces with the pinion, whereby because the other sector gear is stationary, that rotates that pinion, and also moves the central shaft with the cylinder downward. And as that shaft moves downward, it will push on a arm which pulls your escapement mechanism and sets it into position so that when you release a key, it will advance the carriage. Then, for every single one of these keys, the, there is a little notch which will control when and by how much it will move this main bar, and that bar, via some special linkages. I think, ah, uh, okay, so, seems like, yeah, so that bar, I think it, there's a middle, bar here, which interacts with another sector, here independently, as you can see, depending on what character you're pressing. But once that sector here is engaged, that will move that will move this thing. To which is attached that little pin which will eventually lower during the rotation of the key until 
stops at one of those notches on that cam, allowing for only the specific character to be inked by the ink roller. And as that ink roller is hit, it will also rotate to expose a different part of the ink roller each time. And then finally imprint that character onto the page. Then for your shifting mechanism, basically all that's happening is that you have these two bars that will, using these pins here to control how far they move, will push down on this bar here. pulls up, or pushes up, on that bar, which interfaces with a pin, or rather that little tab over there. Let's see. And then pushes the central shaft up which moves your type cylinder and accesses the different rows. In this case, we will see that it is quite essential that this spring here, this retention spring, is proper, properly implemented and clicked into place. Otherwise, when you're trying to shift or when you're trying to type, the type cylinder will fly out, or when you unshift, it will stay up, which you don't want. So once you're in a shifted position, then that little notch that got pushed will slot into one of those alignment slots, which basically makes sure that that shifting position is held during the stroke. So now it will slot into the other slot. And finally, the corresponding slot for the fixed key. And lastly, you will notice that when you're typing on a respective side, there is a little lock here. And that lock will basically prevent the type head from moving when nothing is pressed. So pressing the key will move that lever and also unlock the respective sector gear. While the other one remains locked in position until it is freed by the motion of this bar. So, like, say if I'm pressing on one side, if it's a T, then it will free that side from motion earlier. While if I'm pressing the Z key, it will take longer before it finally frees and unlocks that part. Like so. So locked, and then freed. Locked, and then freed. So that is how the Blick and Stirfer typewriter works, and indeed that is pretty difficult to explain in common or whatever English, given all the things that go on in this mechanism, but it is quite a fascinating thing once you do know how it works. And now if you want to put the carriage back on, just slide it back in. You have to get it into those slots. Like so. Pull down the space bar. 
and then lower that margin stop. Then you're ready to type again. Lastly, another thing that I had to do, other than access that little spring at the bottom to reduce the amount of spring force that is being used to push the carriage along, there is a spring here, which is responsible for helping to basically lift the type shaft back up when you're done typing a character. And there's also another spring over there, which is responsible for resetting that little pin there, which is responsible for stopping the type cylinder from rotating, so that it will index to the correct character. Um, in my case, to make this particular machine feel lighter, I had to push this in. Then for this particular part, I have to go and loosen a screw that should be situated over here, that screw. And maybe not exactly necessarily that nut. Now of course it was probably all seized and rusted, but with enough force I was able to push this in and reduce the tension of the spring so that it actually starts completely unstretched for a bit. And then it starts moving while still being strong enough to lift and reset this mechanism fast enough. Okay, so now let's type. So you would have seen that once I got to the end of the line, normally what you would do is you would just hold this down, push your line advance lever, and then pull. That's because the line advance mechanism or lever also automatically engages your carriage release. But if you want to achieve a much faster and smoother operation, it is possible to just hold down your spacebar, which doubles as a uh, carriage release, and then just press with your thumb and flick like that. So, then type in, flick, and you're at your next line quite quickly. And then, also in terms of technique, now, I believe the official manual um, recommends a three-finger technique, whereas I prefer to still use my pinkies, which work for me. And in some cases, if I want to type able. Um, so typically when you're typing, you don't want to have to use the same finger consecutively. So I use this technique where I actually press a letter with my thumb. It's weird, but it works, so... Okay, so that's what it looks like in typing action. Um, since this video has already been going for very long, mainly due to all the explanation of the mechanics, 
I will be doing and posting a separate video um, where I speed type on this interesting layout. Alright, so once that speed typing video has been posted, you should be able to see it in the card up here, or in the video description, or in the pinned comment. Now, from that you would have seen that thanks to this special optimized layout, most of the typing would occur on your bottom home row, eventually progressing upwards to your second and finally your third row for the least common characters. Um, and basically, in addition to reducing the need for your moving your fingers, it also optimizes the amount by which this type cylinder has to move. So from the least being the E character, which is already just on this side of the cylinder, versus, say, the J, which would be on this side, where it has to make an almost 180 degree rotation. So that allows this machine to be used as fast as possible for its particular mechanism. Though in this case, unfortunately, due to the fact that to reliably index um, a character, you have to completely release a key. Unlike on typewriters, where you can have more than, or type bar typewriters, where it is possible to have more than one uh, type bar in flight at a time without them colliding and jamming. So that allows these machines to be used for, like, in, at the fastest with, say, uh, at least from what I found on, I think, Stella Pajunas from 1946. Her record was like 216 WPM, or an average of 18 um, characters per second, which is quite darn fast, <laughs> compared to 5 to 6 on this machine, or 4 to 5 on this machine. But again, the point was that these machines would use much less parts than their corresponding standard typewriters, like so, allowing them to be more affordable when you don't need a speed. Um, and again, you could even save more money with these index machines which don't even have a keyboard at all. Just an index and a key press, or impression key. Alright, so if you found this video interesting or find these machines interesting and would like to learn more about them, um, for example, I'll be covering this machine and that machine, as well as this electric over here fairly soon, well, I mean, in the coming weeks, um, feel free to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.